Hello and welcome to Review. This is the second episode of Review, uh, the one in which we both wear blue t-shirts. And it's the same thing as half in the bag. What is? The show, because it's just me and you. It won't always just be me and you, though. I know, the first couple episodes are. We have to establish the series, establish uh, something that people will want to watch, and then that's when we dump in like Rich Evans and, and the, the lesser red letter media people right. that nobody likes. Right. Nobody. But today we're talking about John Carpenter's Escape from New York from 1981. Uh, the difference between this episode and the last one is that our first episode, Tremors, Jay and I both loved the film. Yes. And this is, a, this is an episode where Jay loves a film and I, I don't want to say loathe, but I, I uh, I'm not a big fan of, okay. uh, and we're going to discuss that in detail. So uh, it's a little twist, a yeah. little twist on the formula. Uh, and and uh, there will be probably be future episodes where there's a movie that I love that Jay absolutely hates. I know how much you love Waterworld. Well, the plot of Escape from New York is, is very simple. Uh, it takes place in the future of 1997, the long, far distant future of 1997. Uh, also, according to the title card, it's now, so I don't know how that works. But the credit sequence is may maybe the most exciting credit sequence I've ever seen. That's, that's how you start a credit scene of a low-budget movie. Doo -doo -doo. You get people in with the with the, the mood of the movie, with the music, but uh, we'll get to the music, I suppose, because I'm sure you're a huge fan of that, too. Uh, but anyway, it's 1997, uh, inexplicably, uh, New, uh, Manhattan has been walled off. It's been turned into a giant prison. Anyone, uh, crime is up 400%. I was gonna say, not inexplicably, that's why. Sure, but the idea of taking Manhattan, one of the most uh, expensive mm -hmm. chunks of real estate in the country and turning it into a prison. Mm -hmm. wait, but who wait. knows what happened to it in the, you know, the 10 years between when crime rose and now. But yeah, it's been turned into a prison. Anyone that commits any crime of any sort, immediately deported to the, the New York prison. And they're never let out. Yeah. Uh, and then the, the president is uh, played by Donald Pleasance, and Air Force One gets hijacked by, by terrorists, by radicals that crash it into New York City. And it's up to Kurt Russell as Snake Plissken, who's about to be sent into the prison anyway, to rescue the president. They give him an ultimatum where if he does it, he will be pardoned of all of his crimes. Uh, yeah, uh, it's, it's uh, I have to say, I, th this is my. This was my second viewing of the film. I had watched it in a number of years back on your recommendation, uh, and I, I, I hated it. <laughs> I was so bored. And then upon the second viewing, uh, I want to say I hated it, <laughs> but but uh, I'll be honest, I appreciated it more. Well, it's it's a bit of an anomaly because I think most people consider it an action movie, yeah. but the action is the, the weakest aspect of the movie. That's that's the thing. It feels like a movie that we've watched on Best of the Worst, uh, where it has the typical 80s action poster cover, like guy with the machine gun and then Statue of Liberty and yeah. all this stuff. And then you watch it and it's, it's just like boring. I'm a fan of John Carpenter. I don't hate him as much. I only hated Assault on Precinct 13. He's he's really good at um, mood. Yeah, it's it's the atmosphere, and that that's that's what I love about Escape from New York. Yeah, there's more really... so than the action because the the most exciting oh, yeah. thing that happens in the whole movie is Snake Plissken uh, perforates a hole in the wall with his gun, and he just kind of jumps through it. And it sounds like paper mache. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, it really is. It's the uh, the the look of it, the look of the worlds. I love sci-fi movies from that era, from like the 70s and 80s. The the really, and a lot of this is necessitated by budget, but just that really like stark, uh, minimalists, like the prison at the beginning of the movie. There's not a lot of detail on anything, just some boards with lights on it. Like I love that look. And then when he gets into the New York City, the prison, like, I love the look of that world. Yeah, and the funny thing is they shot it in New York in 1980 and didn't dress anything, any of the sets or anything. Times Square looks great. <laughs> Let's just use it. It's Dean Cundy who shot mm -hmm. Halloween. 
classic Dean Cundy cinematographer. He did Halloween, he did this, you know, he went on to do Back to the Future, he did Jurassic Park, he did Jack and Jill, all the classics. Jack and Jill, the, the lighting in that, the cinematography is just exquisite. Absolutely. The richness of color, uh, the, the, the contrast, the shadows, the, how it's, it's painting with light. Everyone wants my Dunkachino. Can't get enough of my Dunkachino. Uh, yeah, there's some really nice shots in it. There's beautiful matte paintings, mm. some great miniatures, all sorts of stuff. And they didn't have a lot of time or money to do lots of camera setups. So huge chunks of the movie take place, are just shot in these wide shots um, that are brand new lenses that shot in very low light. So you can see just blocks and blocks down these streets that were basically just lit with natural lighting, just with these, you know, just with the street lights and stuff. Mm -hmm. And uh, the fact that so much of the movie plays out in these wides, like you're constantly aware of the surroundings. Mm -hmm. You're constantly aware, and there's, there's just these shots, these you know, gliding shots that follow Snake Plissken along. Like, it's very dreamlike. Hi, Chief. Nice night. Hey. <coughs> it's a mood piece. It's, it's what Quentin Tarantino would call a hangout movie, where there's a story, the story's serviceable, the concept is neat, implausible, but neat, I think. But it, it really is more just about sort of taking in this environment and, and and these characters, because this is like we talked about Tremors as being, people think of it as the Kevin Bacon movie, but it's an ensemble. And yeah. I would call this an ensemble too, because it's Snake Plissken meets all these these characters along the way. You got Ernest Borgnine, his cabbie, who er I love. Ernest Borgnine is like the worst actor I've ever seen. Oh my God, he's great in this movie. He's always so, he's, he's got like the Molotov cocktail. I've been driving a cab here for 30 years and I'm telling you, you don't walk around here at night. <laughs> yes, sir. It'll kill you and strip you in 10 seconds flat. Usually I'm not done around here myself, but I wanted to catch that show. This stuff is like gold around here, you know. It's like gold. <laughs> That's why I look at like Big Trouble in Little China and it's just Kurt Russell running around as well, uh, doing his John Wayne impersonation and here he's doing his space comp impersonation. <laughs> which is, Some might say it's a Clint Eastwood impersonation. The very but. first character you see in the film is Space Cop. The guy pulls up <laughs> and he's got the big, the big helmet. But um, it is a premise that it feels like a five-year-old made. Like here the president's gonna fly his plane over and they have to drop him out in the special escape egg. And, <laughs> <laughs> Donald Pleasance is in this escape bag with the briefcase attached to his arm, and it's so ridiculous. It's it's corny, and the, but it's played straight, which is why it's so why it's but so. But the great. act, there's no like, there's no good. If it had like tons of like crazy, out of control action, 1980s schlock action, well, with that, that premise, I'd be like, yes. Sure. I mean, that's attributed to the the low budget. Like, exactly. And that's, that's a problem with a lot of John Carpenter movies. Is like his imagination is bigger than his budgets were a lot of the time. It, it's, it's a great premise for a silly movie. It's not a great premise for a, a moody, dark movie you're supposed to kind of take seriously. A guy with the eye patch, his name's Snake. That's why you're not, I don't think you are supposed to take it seriously. And that, that contrast between the goofiness of the premise and the characters and the, the serious tone is what I like about it. It never winks at you though. It never That's winks fine. at you. And when it doesn't wink at you, then you're like, are you for real? <laughs> It's hard for me to get uh, really, really into it. And is this a case of, uh, you know, rose-colored glasses from, from your childhood? I, I actually didn't see it when I was young. I saw Escape from L.A. first. The matte paintings, James Cameron, a young James Cameron worked on those matte paintings of the city. And, and the, the creativity of the way they accomplish things on a low budget. Sure. Like there's, there's this one bit that I, I, I absolutely love. Computer simulation, tracking Air Force One. You see a miniature of the plane's point of view coming into the building. They couldn't afford to blow up a building or crash a plane, so it just cuts to this monitor, like just as it's about to hit. And it's like, oh, that's clever. Mm -hmm. It's a clever way to get around the fact that you couldn't do that. Yeah, see, I love, I love certain elements like that. I, I love that he's so... Uh... It was an accident. About an hour ago, a small jet went down inside New York City. The president was on board. President of what? That's not funny, Pliskin. 
he doesn't care about anyone or anything except what he has to accomplish to, to he's the he's an anti-hero there's that moment early on when he's going down a hallway and he looks in this room and there's a woman like half unconscious being assaulted by like oh, three yeah. guys like they rip off her shirt and he's looking in mm-hmm. he just keeps on going and you don't get in a lot of movies a character that that is that uh cynical and that far removed from what you usually see as your your protagonist he's just essentially space cop he's, he's he's space cop yeah he he acted just like um uh paul rudd in wet hot american summer his character he's like <laughs> whatever i know you you have a thing for post-apocalypse i do uh, this is my favorite one. Yeah. This I, has the quintessential, the, uh, the the Romero character, the skinny punk rock guy with mm-hmm, the big hair. Yeah. He's like the quintessential like post-apocalyptic like punk rock character. Yep, yep. You touch me, he dies. If you're not in the air in 30 seconds, he dies. If you come back in, he dies. The, uh, uh... So, cyberpunk? What were they called in Robocop? Splatterpunk? Splatterpunk! In Robocop 3. Splatterpunks. <laughs> that's, what, that's what I aspire to be in the post apocalypse. A splatterpunk? I just want to wait around for like main characters from a movie to show up in my neighborhood, and then when I see them, I'm like, ooh. <laughs> I really scared him. I've been waiting weeks for this. Weeks. I'm sitting around, I'm crazy, I'm waiting for this. <laughs> Eating beans out of can. Ooh. <laughs> That's my, my one goal in life. I understand. So Donald Pleasance, AKA the president, gets into a space egg. Our British president. A British He's president. British. Yeah, he has an accent. <laughs> that should be noted. Uh, he gets into a, a Dr. Evil egg and yes. gets launched out down there. Uh, and then Snake Plissken uh, is tricked by a scientist who tells him he's going to be inocu- inoculated, inoculated to resist bacterial infections, but they really put two capsules into his neck that will explode in 24 hours. Come out now. They're protected by the courts. 15 minutes before the last hour is up, we can neutralize the charge with X-rays. What if I'm a little late? No more Hartford Summit, and no more Snake Plissken. Uh, That's his incentive to to rescue the president. Ah, but in the script terms, it's called what? The ticking clock. And in this case, it's a literal ticking clock. There's a literal ticking clock, yeah. Literally. Okay, I'm gonna get a president. Uh, what, if, what if I do this? Well, I'll shoot you down if you try and fly the plane past New York and leave. Yeah. Uh, okay, um, you know, then the, the, his incentive, motivation to get the president. It's his only motivation, because he doesn't give a fuck about anything. Sure, and then, <laughs> but then it's like, okay, then the scientist guy goes, you gotta tell him. Tell him. That to me felt like, uh, it was so much upfront plot. It's like, boom, you got president. President is down. He's, uh, you know, the splatterpunks got him. Your neck's going to blow up in 24 hours. You got to get him. Nothing else. I do like, though, after, uh, there's, there, you know, Snake Plissken has dropped in, and he's looking for the president. He's following the tracker. It's on the bomb. Mr. President. I'm the president. Sure, I'm the president. I, I, I knew when I, I got this thing, I, I'd be president. And then after that, he just kind of doesn't know what to do. Yeah. There's that great shot, and it's just sort of following him along. And he, he just takes a minute, there's just a chair, and he just sits in the chair for a minute, and he's just like, well, I'm out of ideas. Because <laughs> that's not the kind of thing you see in like an action movie, where the character's just like, eh, now what? I don't know. Yeah, I mean, there's a, there's a laid back quality to it that's really nice and kind of fun. This is the part when he hides out, the crazies are coming out, so he hides in the truck full of nuts, mm-hmm. and he meets that woman. Plane crashed seven hours ago near 8th Avenue. Did you see it? No. Shit. You're a cop. I'm an asshole. And you're like, oh, love interest. Yeah. Take me out with you, Snake. Why? I can think of lots of reasons why. (laughs) 
<laughs> oh, I guess not. Yeah. You gonna kill me now, Snake? I'm too tired. Maybe later. Yeah, and, and that's, let's talk about the music. I was in, I, I'm not the biggest fan of John Carpenter's music. Uh, it, it, it's very unique. It's, it's something that I, a few years ago I would say it dates the movie. I like that type of music just in general and not even like a nostalgic way. I like that synth kind of sound. Um, but now that's starting to get popular again. So mm. it's not even really dated anymore. Yeah. <laughs> now it's coming back it's, around. It's retro, retro popular again, that 80s, 80s style. But this, like, I was picturing it with like a really good, full orchestral with kind a of with a more traditional, traditional action score. score. A lot of scenes would take on a completely different. Like I was thinking about yeah. that, especially at the end when they're going across the bridge. John Carpenter is referred oftentimes to his scores as wallpaper. It's like he kind of wants you to just forget that it's there. It's just sort of, am he thinks of it more as like ambience a lot of the time. I mean, everyone, there seems to be a lot of people that love John Carpenter's score. I'm just going to be honest, I'm not one of them. <laughs> I, think, I, think, I think it's a detriment to the film. I think it could be, the film could have been elevated a little in terms of what it is supposed to be. Right. A movie for, for about the action it. scenes, yeah. yeah. There, there are other parts that I really, I mean, I like the music just because I like that type of music, but like the part when he's going into the city and the, the little plane. And it's like this weird ethereal oh, yeah, music yeah. and you know, we're seeing the miniatures of the city. Like, I like, I like all that stuff a lot. There's a lot of admirable qualities to Escape from New York. The, the, the ideas are all there. It's just a little, the execution's a little cheap, sloppy. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Push that satire a little more. Give each character a little more goofiness. A little, a little more over the top. Wink at the audience a little more pump up that score, cut it a little faster, do something. It, it, to me, it falls in the crack between several types of things. It's in funny, a strange you, way. Sure, yeah, I, I can understand that. When you talk about like, like, you know, up the humor, make the characters goofier, have more exciting action music. Everything you're describing is Escape from L.A. Hey, maybe I'd so. like that. That'll be our next episode. We'll do Escape from L.A. at some point. <laughs> That'll be in some episode in the future. That movie's shit. <laughs>